Earth has told us anything, it's that where you find water, you often find life. So if we are to stand any chance of finding life elsewhere in the solar system, somewhere that hosts liquid water on its surface is a promising place to start. Trident is a mission concept under consideration by NASA that would see a spacecraft sent to explore Triton, Neptune's largest moon and a body thought to have liquid ocean beneath its surface. For this episode, we spoke to Louise Proctor, who is leading the Trident mission, to find out more about what the spacecraft might discover and how it will get there. So my name is Louise Proctor. I'm the principal investigator of the Trident uh, mission proposal. And I'm also uh, a planetary scientist. I work in the US. I am currently the director of the Lunar and Planetary Science Institute in Houston, Texas. And uh, Well, thanks very much for speaking to me today, Louise. Um, this uh, Trident mission sounds really, really interesting. I mean, it's ultimately going to send a, a probe to study um, Neptune's moon Triton. I was wondering if you would tell us a bit more about um, the, the concept of the mission and, and how it came about. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, we're still in the study phase right now. We have not yet been selected for flight. We hope that's going to happen uh, about a year from now, but um, we're in competition with several other mission proposals. Uh, However, if we are selected, we would focus on Neptune's large moon Triton. Uh, It's one of the largest bodies in the solar system, and it's very little explored, but it's a very fascinating place. Um, What makes Triton such a such a body ripe for for discovery and exploration, in your opinion? Triton is one of the largest uh, moons in the solar system. It's an icy world, a rocky interior with a a thick ice covering. We don't know quite how thick, Uh, but it seems very unusual even among icy bodies. Uh, The surface of Triton is extremely young, possibly um, the second youngest surface in the solar system. Um, The surface also has activity upon it. Um, Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft to have visited the Neptune system. It flew past Neptune and Triton in 1989. And at that time, Voyager spotted uh, plumes of dark material coming off the surface and rising about eight kilometers up and then getting dragged downwind for about 150 kilometers. So we know there's some activity on the surface. We don't know what causes that um, or why the surface is so young, how that surface is refreshed. Uh, But there are some other things as well. We think that Triton might have an ocean beneath its icy surface, which would make it very exciting and a possible candidate for a habitable world in the solar system. And then it's got some other interesting characteristics too. Um, It has an ionosphere, a a, a region of charged particles around the moon, just like we have around the Earth. Uh, But that ionosphere is is 10 times more intense than that around any other moon in the solar system. Um, And usually ionospheres around uh, icy bodies are driven by the sun. And yet we're, we're very, very far away from the sun. We're at 30, uh, 30 times further than the Earth is from the sun. So that's a bit of a mystery. So there are a lot of mysteries about Triton. I think whenever you talk about um, the the, the uh, plumes coming up from, from Triton's surface, a lot of people will think of the what the Cassini mission saw at um, Saturn's moon Enceladus. Do, do we think that, that, that Triton and Enceladus could be quite similar? The plumes are quite interesting. They were, of course, the first plumes that we saw coming off an icy body long before the uh, Enceladus plumes were discovered. And now, you know, some people think there might be plumes at Europa as well, another icy moon. Um, At the time they were discovered in 1989, it was thought that they were the result of a sort of greenhouse effect where dark material, possibly sort of rocky or dusty material, um, lying below several metres of transparent nitrogen ice was being heated up by the the very weak sun um, and eventually became overpressurised and exploded through the ice above it, um, almost in a geyser-like Uh, process. But since we've discovered the plumes on Enceladus um, and have sort of gone back and looked at the Triton plumes again, we now think that they might be, they're they're very massive uh, compared to what we might predict for sublimation driven plumes, these sort of solar driven plumes. And so we're now starting to reevaluate, could they be what we would call cryovolcanic? Could they actually be originating from some subsurface uh, liquid reservoir in the same way that the Enceladus plumes uh, originated from an ocean? originating from an ocean. So so we don't know for sure, but uh, you know, one of our primary objectives is to try and figure out what drives the plumes. Are they a, a greenhouse kind of process or are they actually a, a icy volcanism process? 
Is, is it unusual that um, uh, a moon, like an, an icy rocky moon that's so far from the sun, could, could be this active? It is unusual for um, something that you might think it's, you know, it, it's four and a half billion years old. Shouldn't it be very old and dead right now? Um, but of course, there are a lot of bodies in the solar system that still have a heat source. Uh, a great example is the, the moons of Jupiter, the large moons of Jupiter, particularly Io and possibly Europa, we think are active today. Io, of course, is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And the reason is because it's going around Jupiter in a slightly elliptical orbit and it gets gravitationally tugged one way and another by its sibling moons by Europa and to a lesser extent Ganymede. And so this tidal heat uh, creates the volcanism on Io. So in the same way we get tides on the Earth, they get tides on Io. Uh, with Triton, it's a little bit different because uh, we still think tidal heating is occurring, but Triton is in a very peculiar orbit. It's in a highly inclined orbit and it's actually traveling backwards. So we think it got captured early in its history. We think it might have originated in the Kuiper belt um, so sort of where Pluto and other objects are. Uh, and it somehow got captured into orbit around Neptune into this very oblique, uh, highly inclined orbit. And because of that highly inclined orbit, uh, we think it's tidally heated every time it sort of goes above and below the equatorial plane of Neptune. And so we think that it may have an ocean beneath the surface because we think the heating is sufficient to create an ocean. Uh, but what's unusual about Triton is that ocean um, is sort of created in, by a different kind of tidal heating than we see elsewhere. And so, yes, it's very surprising that something that's so far away from the sun and so you know old on the interior uh, could have such a young exterior and could still have liquid water beneath its surface today. Mm. Yeah, and and regarding that that liquid water, I mean, one of the things that I often hear planetary scientists say is when it comes up that the, the, the cases that we're looking for signs of life elsewhere in the solar system beyond Earth, you sort of follow the water because we know from Earth that wherever water is, life probably exists. Um, so do, do you think that makes the uh, Trident mission in the, in the same league as, as something as Cassini or or, or, or one of those um, <laughs> Mars missions that's that's actually searching for for signs of life beyond Earth. Um, we are we are hoping to take the first step. There are, there are a lot of things involved in searching for life, but as you mentioned, one of the primary things that we need for life is liquid water. And so if we can determine for certain whether there is liquid water beneath the surface of Triton, then that immediately puts it into a potentially habitable world. Um, we also need to understand whether it has the right ingredients for life. So composition is the composition, you know, the, the chemical ingredients, the kinds of things that you need. We know it has a, a long-lived energy source. Um, so it certainly becomes a whole lot more interesting if we find that it has uh, liquid water beneath the surface. Um, of course, there are a lot of other stages, you know, is that water is the water beneath the surface, um, you know, does it have the right sort of pH? You know, there, if it's too acid or too alkaline, then probably life can't exist, things like that. Those are way beyond what we can do with the Trident mission. Uh, but we can certainly take the first step to find out whether a world that is so far away from the sun and more, even more interestingly, a world in which, you know, it was captured, that ocean didn't form um, at the beginning of the solar system. That ocean probably was formed when it got captured and has persisted. So it's almost like, has has that ocean been created? It's like nature versus nurture. You know, was it nurtured into existence? And and it certainly does make it a, a much more interesting target for a future mission to determine its habitability. Yeah, definitely. And it's really interesting what you were saying there about, um, I suppose, the only... The only probe sent from Earth that's um, studied Triton so far is uh, was the Voyager 2 spacecraft. Um, what exactly did Voyager 2 discover and, and how will um, Trident build upon that? Well, um, some of the things I mentioned earlier that we know about Triton, we learned from Voyager. For example, uh, the ionosphere, the fact that it's unusually intense, um, we learned that from Voyager. Um, we also uh, took images of uh, about 40% of the surface and most of them were very low resolution to kind of what we're used to now when we see images of the moon or Mars, for example. Um, and those images showed uh, not only the plumes that we discussed earlier, but also um, a very unusual 
alien landscape, you know, really bizarre landforms of the kinds that we hadn't seen on any other moon before. Um, so those are really uh, exciting and interesting. What Voyager didn't do is it didn't carry an instrument that could measure the composition. So most of what we know about the composition of Triton, we know from ground-based or near-Earth uh, telescopic observations. And because Triton's so far away, we can't learn a lot about it uh, from the ground, which is one reason why we want to go back. Um, and the uh, what we think we know about the interior, um, the prediction that it has an ocean, that's all been done from modeling that's been done over the last sort of 10 or 20 years. So those results are quite recent. So Voyager was fantastic, you know, and we, we learned a lot about this very unusual moon. Um, but a lot more has been learned since then just from uh, ground-based telescopes and modeling efforts. Have you yet decided? Because this, this is the mission is still in its uh, proposal stages. Have, have you have you sort of decided what what science instruments um, you're going to have? And is there a <laughs> is there a bit of a battle between the different science teams as to as to as to which instruments <laughs> take take precedence? Well, as a scientist, um, you're, you're, you know, we're very greedy. We always want more data and we always want more science. Um, and this is a very, uh, you know, a relatively low cost mission. So we can only put a, a, we call it a payload. We can only put a limited number of instruments on the spacecraft. Nevertheless, we have chosen our instruments with care um, and we have chosen them to answer our science objectives. Um, and so the instruments that we have chosen, we have a magnetometer, which is very important because we are going to be able to determine whether or not Triton has an ocean. We won't be able to tell much about it, but we'll be able to say, is there an ocean or not, which is, uh, you know, a key measurement. We have um, two very nice cameras, a, a narrow angle camera. It's almost like a telescope that we can take images from far away and we can take very high resolution, sort of close up images of the surface. And we have uh, a wide angle camera, which we will actually use to image part of Triton's surface in reflected light from Neptune, so almost uh, in shadow, but we can still see a lot of detail there. And the reason for that is so that we can image some of the surface uh, that Voyager saw and compare those. Uh, another instrument that we are carrying is a uh, an infrared spectrometer. So this will um, enable us to see for the first time the composition of different landforms and different regions on the surface. And so we'll be able to compare those to data that we have from telescopes here on Earth and near the Earth. So that's going to be very exciting. Um, so we can start to look at whether there are things like organic compounds and other very interesting compounds on the surface of Triton. And then we are also carrying a plasma spectrometer. So this will be able to measure the particle environment as we fly through uh, the environment around Triton, we're actually going down to about 300 kilometers uh, above the surface. So we will be able to measure uh, the, the particle environment as we go through from far away, right close to the surface and then back out again. So this is also very exciting. And all of these measurements will allow us to um, compare to Voyager and compare to our models and, and learn new things about how Triton works and operates. I suppose in terms of the the science payload, it's also about um, new new technology that that didn't exist when when Voyager launched, and and the fact that probably the you know the instruments will be a lot sharper and be able to capture capture more data. That's exactly right. Um, I mean, Voyager was uh, an incredible mission, really sophisticated, and of course did the grand tour of the outer solar system. You know, saw things we'd never seen before. Um, what we plan to do with Triton is we're using instruments that are tried and tested, but they are, of course, very much more um, advanced uh, than the Voyager instruments. And so what we're able to do with Triton is take uh, instruments that have flown before and just make little tweaks to them. We don't need any new major technology. We're just using them uh, in a new way to do this um, encounter with Triton and learn so much more about it. What would the uh, journey out to Triton be like because these uh, planetary probes they always have to kind of go around the houses don't they doing doing gravity assist maneuvers and have, <laughs> have you actually got to the stage of, of working out what the route would be? Well you you know you can get from A to B in many different ways um, if you have a very large large rocket a very large launch vehicle that gives uh, you know it's a lot of power a lot of oomph uh, you can go pretty fast and you can go pretty far uh, in this case we are 
trying to fit under uh, a cost cap um, for a certain type of mission class called Discovery. The Discovery mission cap is about 500 million US dollars, which of course sounds like an awful lot to to you and me, but in planetary exploration terms, it's considered a, a relatively small low class mission and because of that we um, we're trying to do everything in a in a most cost effective way and so we're going to use a a, a sort of medium a sort of small to medium class launch vehicle it's not certainly not one of the the larger ones like the that would take humans to Mars in the future for example um, so it's a, a a smaller launch vehicle. And because of that, we have to use Jupiter uh, for a gravity assist. So we use Jupiter and we kind of swing around Jupiter on the way and it, it swings us nicely into position where we can encounter uh, Triton. But it does take a long time when you go on a smaller launch vehicle. So in our case, we would launch at the end of 2025 and we would arrive uh, at the Neptune Triton system in 2038. So, you know, you you trade speed for um, cost, basically. You know, the whole this whole business is all about trades. And in this case, we're going to take longer to get there. We have a lot more patience, you know, we have to be patient, uh, but we will get there and we can still do exactly the same science, just takes a little bit longer. And once it finally gets there, is is it going to be an orbiter or is it, or is it more of a flyby mission? Um, we, uh, we, we like to call it an encounter, um, but we do, we fly by Triton, but the beautiful thing about Triton is, uh, that it, it rotates around, uh, in its orbit. It rotates completely about once every 5.9 days. It's, it's tidally locked to Neptune, so it keeps the same face pointed to Neptune, just as our moon is tidally locked to the Earth. Um, but because we have this fantastic camera and these other instruments, we can start uh, our encounter sequence um, about nine days. You know, the whole thing takes about nine days. So several days away from Triton, we start imaging it. And as we fly towards it and then past it, uh, it rotates uh, almost beneath us, if you like, or next to us. And so we can actually get near global coverage just by flying by. So this is another sort of wonderful example of orbital mechanics, you know, the way the solar system is cooperating with us in this case. And because we have these instruments that can start to take data of the surface from so very far away. And then once we fly by, we turn around and look back and we can do things while uh, Triton is in eclipse, you know, so we can see... Um, the limbs of Triton uh, with the sun shining from behind. And so if there are plumes, things like that, we can actually look at them on the limb. We can tell the shape of Triton, things like that. So we can do some some quite sophisticated things, uh, again, building on what we've learned uh, in planetary exploration over the last 50 years, really. It, it just sounds absolutely incredible. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of the um, Kuiper Belt encounter that uh, New Horizons performed after its after its time at Pluto. Is, is, it, is it similar to that? It's it's yes, and and New Horizons was of course a wonderful mission, and we saw so much, uh, you know, learned so much about Pluto. Of course, we'd never seen it before with a spacecraft, and yes, we are doing something very similar. They've sort of shown just how much you can do, and that's that's a very good analogy. And the other thing that's great about that is that because we think Triton started in the Kuiper Belt and Pluto's still in the Kuiper Belt, there are uh, some similarities. We think uh, in the surface, certainly the ices and other materials that we think are on the surface seem similar to Pluto. So this is a great example of comparing the two. What happens if you, you have one body that originates in the Kuiper Belt and just stays there and evolves in place, in situ, and another body that somehow gets kicked out of the Kuiper Belt um, and gets trapped into orbit around this, this ice giant planet, um, you know, in this crazy orbit that it has and uh, then has an ocean created beneath the surface that, you know, what, what happens when you evolve a Kuiper Belt object? Uh, so we can kind of compare them, you know, they, they might have been sort of twin-like twin, twin -like in the past and now we can compare what happens when you take a Kuiper Belt object and then leave it somewhere else for four and a half billion years and see how <laughs> it evolves. So it's a very nice comparison experiment. That's awesome. And is, is there a chance that um, as, as it heads as it heads further out towards the edge of the solar system, um, that that you could potentially do 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 an, another Kuiper Belt fly, flyby. 
There certainly is. And, and we're looking right now at what other science can we do en route. Uh, you know, for example, we, I told you about uh, flying by Jupiter. We need Jupiter's gravity to kind of tweak us in the right direction. Um, so we're hoping to do some observations uh, of the larger Jovian satellites as we go through. Um, after Triton, we hope to do uh, some, you know, we don't know where the Kuiper Belt objects are going to be yet. There's obviously a lot still to be discovered and worked on. But yes, we certainly, um, there's no reason why we couldn't do a flyby of a Kuiper Belt object. And of course, we'll look at Neptune too. At this time, we're considering what Neptune science can be done. But a lot of our instruments uh, can also do great science at Neptune. It, it just sounds like such an exciting mission. But I, I suppose the, the thing that... Um you and your team must be um, considering most is the fact that it's st it still has to be officially approved because you'd mentioned that it's part of the uh, NASA's discovery program. How, how far, how, how close is it to being approved, and and how, and how do you actually um, convince the the upper echelons at NASA to you know to give you the go ahead? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, first of all, we're not supposed to put any pressure onto NASA, so. Um, you know, we're not supposed to influence the reviewers in any way. Uh, but we were originally one of 18 mission concepts that was proposed to NASA. We put in our first proposal uh, in July of 2019. We were one of four missions, uh, mission concepts, I should uh, clarify, that was down-selected uh, this February, last February. And we are now working like crazy, like we've never worked before, uh, to produce what's called a concept study report. This is a, a huge, dense proposal. If you think of a sort of old style phone book, that's what it looks like when it's printed out. Um, <laughs> and in that, we're trying to uh, retire any risks. We're trying to address any weaknesses uh, that we were given um, after we were down selected. Um, and so we turned that in in November. Um, and then we start preparing for what is called a site visit. And usually um, a, a large number of reviewers, it can be many tens of people come to your site where you're maybe building the spacecraft or managing the spacecraft, in this case, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in Pasadena in, in California uh, are managing the mission. And we were planning for them all to come to uh, the J JPL um it would have been in probably March of next year. And then they quiz us. They quiz us very uh, rigorously for at least a day. Um, and then they go away and, they ma and NASA makes a final decision based on what these reviewers come up with. Because we're in the middle of this COVID pandemic, uh, it looks like that site visit will actually be a virtual site visit. So uh, as we understand it right now, we're going to have about two days of virtual uh, back and forth where we will present to these reviewers and they will ask us some very, very challenging questions <laughs> because, you know, we're spending $500 million of taxpayers' money and, of course, they want to make sure that everything's going to work, it's going to survive that long. We're really going to address the science objectives and that it's worthwhile. These missions are, are so few and far between. Um, you know, we want to demonstrate that we're, we're going to do what we set out to do. And so the ultimate decision we expect will be made probably in April or May of 2021. So it's quite a long, arduous process, but the payoff, of course, is is phenomenal science and discovery. Absolutely. I mean, it, it just sounds absolutely fascinating and it, it must be um, must be quite agonising having to wait for that final decision. But um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to wait, wish you and the, and the team all the best of luck with that and hope, hope, hope it gets selected. And um, yeah, uh, thanks very much for speaking to me today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun.